Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is a continuation of the Ezekiel series. Turn to chapter 22. Boy, I'll tell you what. What a stinging rebuke to what is supposedly God's chosen people. Well, because they are God's people, that's why he's punishing them, them the worst. So let's take a look at some of the sins that they're committing. Abominations, actually. An abomination is a sin that God really, an extra special sin that God extra special hates. Yeah. And I hope everybody appreciates the uh, community page. I spend uh, quite a bit of time going through news sources, trying to find relevant stories and interesting things. Uh, usually it's not good news. I mean, it's rarely good news. Rarely. You know, so... Uh, well, Al Alcee Hastings died. I guess that's not... Yeah, the guy was uh, impeached as a judge, and yet he got uh, reelected all the time. I'm like, really? You know, it's like Marion Barry, the former mayor of D.C., got caught snorting coke with a, a hooker in a hotel room, and they reelect him. I think he went to prison or something, and he got reelected. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you wonder, you know? Yeah, <laughs> unbelievable. Well, a pastor that I respect, one of a few, said that uh, the leaders of a country would be a spiritual reflection of the state of the uh, people. So, if the people are wicked, your leaders are going to be wicked. If your people were righteous, they're going to have righteous leaders. Well... Take a look at Washington, D.C., and take a guess what the rest of the nation is. Yeah. Ezekiel 22, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now thou son of man, wilt thou judge? Wilt thou judge the bloody city? Yea, thou shalt show her all her abominations. Then say thou, Thus saith the Lord God, The city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that her time may come, and maketh idols against herself to defile herself. Thou art become guilty in thy blood that thou hast shed. In other words, you know, they're shedding blood. It means they're killing. And hast defiled thyself in thine idols, which thou hast made. And thou hast caused thy days to draw near, and art come even unto thy years. Therefore have I made thee a reproach unto the heathen, and a mocking to all countries. You know what's really sad is I've noticed some of the heathens are more righteous than our own people. I mean, if you went to a high school today, and it was no different when I was in high school in the, the early 70s, could you find five out of a hundred girls that are virgins by the time they graduate from high school? I, I mean, really? I, you know, back in a uh, hundred years ago, it would have been five girls that weren't virgins. I graduated from high school. Boy, things have changed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, and I was no righteous, and nothing in high school, nothing. So Israel was a reproach unto the heathen and a mocking to all countries. They were even worse than the heathens. 
Verse 5. Those that be near and those that be far from thee shall mock thee, which art infamous and much vexed. Behold the princes of Israel, every one were in thee to their power to shed blood. That's right, all the princes used their authority to kill. In thee have they set light by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. So they're going to oppress the very weakest of the weak to steal what little they have, the orphans and the widows. Verse 8, Thou hast despised mine holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. In thee are men that carry tales to shed blood. I kind of suspect that this is uh, men with tails, uh, you know, like telling a tall tale, not a, a, not a tale that swishes away flies. No, not a, not a tale like a dog, but, you know, like telling a tall tale, a story. I think they're bragging about how they killed. Carry tales to shed blood. And in thee they eat upon the mountains. In the midst of thee they commit lewdness. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. Now when the Bible talks about discovering your father's nakedness, they're talking about sleeping with your father's wife. Not necessarily their mother. It could be a stepmother. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. And one hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife, and another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law. Wow. So they're sleeping with their son's uh, wife. And another in thee hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter. Well, it could be a half-sister, but uh, could be a full sister, too. Verse 12, in thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Now, that's what a hitman for the mafia does. They take, you know, they take money for a hit. Well, they call it a gift, but, uh, you know. In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion and hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. Verse 13. Behold, therefore, I have smitten mine hand at thy dishonest gain, which thou hast made, and at thy blood, which hath been in the midst of thee. Can thy heart, can thine heart endure? Or can thine hands be strong in the days of that I shall deal with thee? Oh yeah, I'm going to pay you back for all your evil. Can thine heart endure? Or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. And I will scatter thee among the heathen and disperse thee in the countries and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. And thou shalt take thine inheritance in thyself in the sight of the heathen, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is come uh, I'm sorry, the house, uh, son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. Now, what is dross? Well, if you 
let's say you have a silver mine and you're digging in the rocks and you find a bunch of silver. Well, you put it in a smelter, which is basically a, a melting pot. And the silver is heavy and it's going to sink to the bottom. And then the dross is the stuff that on top the um, that's not silver. Basically the impurities. So you would scrape the dross from the top off. That's basically what they're talking about. So the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Now, God's people are likened unto refined silver. Believe it or not, God is likened unto gold. Take the L out of gold and you got God. So, you know, that's why the, uh, uh, the mercy seat and all those things were overlaid with gold. But Israel was likened unto a refiner of silver. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Let's take a look at Malachi chapter 3. Now, I did a series on the minor prophets oh, years ago. I was looking at some of my, uh, some of the people have been looking at some of my older work. I noticed one video was five years ago. I was like, wow. But Malachi is a very interesting book. So let's go take a look at chapter three. We're only going to read the first, first seven verses. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, I believe this is talking about John the Baptist. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. And that's Christ, right? The new covenant. Whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire... Remember, uh, a refiner, what's a refinery? Well, if it's, uh, you know, Bethlehem Steel or United States Steel, uh, you know, they're taking iron ore and turning it into steel. And they're separating the uh, impurities from the iron. And then they add carbon to it, and then it becomes steel. But if it was a silver refinery, well, you're making silver, and then you're getting rid of all the impurities, and you want 99.99% silver. For he is like a refiner's fire. And that's what you do. You build a fire, and you melt the silver. That's what you do. And like Fuller's soap. Now, what do you do with soap? Ladies know this. You clean your garments. Right? Verse 3. And he, the Lord, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. See, God's people are compared to silver. He wants to purify us like 99.99999% pure silver. Actually, he wants 100%, but you can't get 100% here on earth, but I'm sure the Lord can get 100%. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. 
Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the Harry Potters, oh, I mean, I'm sorry, the, against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages. Oh yeah, you want to have a guy come work for you and then laugh because you you cheated him out of his your you know what you promised to pay him. Oh boy, look out! And when they're talking about false swearers, let me tell you something: you're allowed to lie to the devil's children, absolutely. Uh, take a look at the two midwives that lied to Pharaoh because they didn't kill uh, the male children of the Israelites. Yeah. When they're talking about false swears, what they're talking about is uh, like swearing out a false police report to get somebody else in trouble for something they didn't do that they're innocent of. Oh, look out for them. That's what somebody did try to do to me. May it, may it land on his own head. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. And all these people that say, oh, well, you know, uh, Jesus came in the New Testament. He totally changed everything. Now Jesus loves everybody. You know what? Those people are idiots. They really are. The Lord says, for I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Wow. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 22, verse 18. Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead. They're not silver. They're not gold. They're nothing good. Brass, tin, iron, and lead. You know, there's nothing special about any of those. In the midst of the furnace, they are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because all ye are become dross, behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem, as they gather silver, and brass, and iron, and lead, and tin, into the midst of the fire, to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Oh boy. The fire and the burning up. Where have I read that before? Hmm. Let me think. Second uh, Peter chapter three. And oh, by the way, you're going to find these Torah keepers and these Hebrew roots people. We'll tell you Second Peter doesn't belong in the Bible because it acknowledges Paul as an apostle, and they hate Paul. And actually, they hate the person that sent Paul, but uh, 
What can I tell you? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, according, if you, if you go by the genealogy, genealogical charts, uh, and you added them all up, a Bible's approximately, from the time of Adam and Eve to now, is close to approximately 6,000 years. So, work six days, and the seventh day is the Sabbath, and a day of rest, right? And what does the Lord, doesn't the Lord have a, uh, a thousand year reign when Satan is uh, locked up? Oh yeah. There's going to be a Sabbath of rest of a thousand years. It's in the book of Revelation. So I think the end of the thousand, six thousand years is very close. How close? I don't know. All I know is in the 1800s or so, uh, around the time of the Civil War, there was a what they called the Great Disappointment, the Millerites. And out of them came the Jehovah's Witnesses. Out of them came the Seventh-day Adventists and some other groups. So, you know... Matter of fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses have uh, said the end of the world, the end of the world, several times in the last hundred years. Uh, last time they said the world was going to end by 75, 76, 1975, 76, by the way. Uh, didn't happen. We're still here, right? And then those liars say, well, you know, we really didn't say that. Or you misunderstood or, you know, yeah. No, you guys are liars. Jehovah's Witnesses. You did say that. Because I used to study with somebody that was a member of your group. I shudder to even call it a church. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up oh, okay seeing that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness back to Ezekiel 22 verse 20 as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace, to blow the fire upon it, to melt it. So will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof, as silver is melted in the midst of the furnace. So shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. Now, there's a. I did a Bible study on fire. Uh, not all fire is bad, you know. The Lord's going to pour out fire upon His righteous people too. Oh yeah. All right, let's take a look at more of Paul's writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. You know, they don't like Paul. Some people don't like Paul. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10. 
according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, for every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And that's everybody, people. Verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. See, your good works are not going to be touched by fire. Well, good works in Christ. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. See, you could be saved and your not so good works are burned up, but you're still, you know, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Think about that the next time you want to inject genetic material into your body. From aborted children. Verse 18. Well, 8, 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you uh, seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Oh, yeah. Hey, I got a PhD in evolutionary uh, whatever we call it. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. No, I don't have a PhD in evolutionary, whatchamacallit. I'm just saying. For the wisdom of this world is foolish with foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain or worthless. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 22, verse 23. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. Indignation, God's extreme hatred. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. The prophets of God the prophets, these prophets, devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law. Sounds like the Pharisees in the times of Christ, doesn't it? Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. 
neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. What happens when you build a wall with uh, untempered mortar? It's just like mud. And then when a strong rain comes, the mud just washes away. It doesn't set up like concrete or cement. That's what untempered mortar is. It's just mud. It doesn't harden. And what happens when a strong wind comes with the rain? The wind, the, the, the wall falls down. And if you're in that house, the roof falls on your head. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies, lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. Can you imagine that? S pretending to be a prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord has said nothing to them? Verse 29. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Can you imagine that? The rich stealing everything they can from the poor and the needy. Sounds like uh, today, doesn't it? Verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Ooh. Let's take a look at that. Well, if you want to see somebody that's standing in the hedge, standing in the gap, well, that's a, that's a military term. And I've covered that before in a previous study on this. But, you know, if there's a, a gap is like a hole in a wall. And you don't want the enemy to be able to go through the hole in the wall. Well, that's what the hedge is. Standing in the gap. So let's go to Exodus chapter 32. I guess I'm going to have to read the whole thing. So here it is. God had taken Israel out of Egypt. And Moses is going up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. But uh, taking too long. And people are like, whoa, where is this dude? Man, we've been waiting here for, you know. So let's read verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods. Plural. Make us gods. Oh yeah. Which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Yeah, we don't know what happened to this guy. He's He's been gone. So, you know, make us, a, make us a god here. Yeah, here's some gold. I want you to make a, you know, craft us a god. Did you ever see that bull on Wall Street? Wall Street actually has a bull in New York City. Verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. 
and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf, a golden calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, really? And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Yeah, the golden calf, right? And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Uh -huh. You know, when the people were, you know, sometimes the Lord said, well, I brought them out. But when the people are doing bad, he's like, Moses, you brought these people out. I, I find that, yeah. Sort of like when I was married to my uh, the mother of my kids. When the daughters, when my daughter did something bad, then all of a sudden she was my daughter. And when she did something good, she was mom's daughter. Do you know what your daughter did today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, these people that you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves, Moses. Verse 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worship it. Wow, you're going to worship a God made with your own hands, huh? And have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, plural, O Israel, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So, here it is. The Lord's like, Moses, stand aside. I'm going to wipe these people off the face of the earth. And then after I've done doing that, I'm going to make you a great and mighty nation, Moses. So, what did Moses do? Verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Verse 12, listen to this. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains? Yeah, the Egyptians are going to say, oh yeah, God took them out of Egypt so he could kill them all. For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom... Thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land which I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Now that's what you call intercession. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And there's idiots that'll tell you that the Lord repenting and us repenting means the same thing. Uh, no, it doesn't. It's different. The Lord doesn't have sin to repent of. We do. Verse 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony, the Ten Commandments, were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one 
side and on the other side were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Now listen to this, people. When you're looking at a ministry, take a look at their statement of faith. Very important. And if they say something to the effect that, uh, you know, we believe the Bible in the original autographs or the original writings, uh, basically what they're saying is, well, the originals were inspired, but, you know, all we have now is copies of copies of copies of copies, and we don't know if what they say is the real thing or not. In other words, we don't have Moses' Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone, and since we don't, we can't be absolutely sure the Ten Commandments are right, as written in the Bible. I hope I explain that correctly, to well, to where you could understand. I mean, seriously, when they say original autographs or original writings, they're basically saying, well, you know... We don't have the tables, uh, tablets of stone that Moses brought down from the mountain, so we can't be 100% certain of what they say or wrote or read or, you know, we're not sure. But we know those originals, all oh, those were right, but what we have now, well, we're not so sure. When you get at something like that, you know what? Tell them to go to hell. Really, you know, because basically what they're saying is, well, you know, God's in a, God's unable to preserve his word. Really, that's that's what it boils down to. Well, God, God did it with the originals, but, you know, we don't have the originals anymore. And, you know, uh, Satan was more powerful and he corrupted them. You know, that's what we believe. Well, that's what they believe. I don't. I absolutely believe that God preserved his words from Hebrew to English and from Greek to English or German or whatever. I absolutely believe that. There wouldn't be 666 different versions of the Bible. And I'm being sarcastic but not really. But there wouldn't be so many different versions of the Bible if they were all corrupted. There wouldn't be any need for it. You wouldn't need the NIV or the complete Jewish Bible or the New American Standard Bible or the whatever, English Standard Version or ESV or whatever, or the Douay Reims or whatever, or the complete or the, or the Living Bible. Or the Children's Living Bible. You know, I call that the son of a bitch Bible because it says, because Saul called his son Jonathan a son of a bitch. Yeah. Yeah, you hand that Bible, uh, the Children's Living Bible to your kid. and, Mommy, what's that word? B-I-T-C-H? Uh, what, Johnny? Is that bitch? Uh, 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 uh. Where'd you get that from? It's in my Bible. Oh. Yeah. And Billy Graham, Billy Goat Graham endorsed that Bible. Yeah. The son of a bitch Bible. So. Yeah. Statement of faith, people. Very important. My statement of faith is the King James Bible and the Nicene Creed. Verse 17, Exodus 32, uh, 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they came, uh, shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the 
tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. You know, Moses broke all ten commandments that day. He broke all ten commandments. Boom. Nobody broke the ten commandments like Moses did. Verse 20. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Ugh. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Now remember, Moses and Aaron were Levites of the tribe of Levi. You know, the tribe that was supposed to serve the Lord. Aaron was the brother of Moses. And Aaron said, Let not thine anger of my Lord wax taut. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Oh, yeah, I, there was a fire, and I threw all this gold in, and this, this molted magical golden calf popped out. Uh, sorry, Aaron. That, yeah. Verse 25, And when Moses saw that the people were naked... For Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, listen to this carefully. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me. Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. What book? The book of life. This is the Lamb's book of life. People, your names can be blotted out of the book of life. So much for eternal security, once saved, always saved. They turn that into an excuse to, you know... Oh, don't worry about it. You can sin all you want. You know, you said a prayer, a sinner's prayer to Billy Goat Graham revival, and don't worry about it. You know, just, you can keep your hit man for the mafia job. Yeah, I understand it pays really good. You make a lot of money doing that, you know. But just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Hallelujah. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Our, your names can be blotted out of the book of life. And Moses got on probably on his hands and knees and said, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. That, my friends, is intercession. 
Let's go back to Ezekiel 22, verse 30. These people are doing a bunch of evil. Just, you know, nothing changes. Whether it's in the days of Moses or if it's in the days of Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Isaiah. Ezekiel 22, 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. See, there was nobody like Moses to stand in the gap to make intercession for the people. Remember, God went to Abraham. Well, his angels. And said, I'm going to go to Sodom and check it out. And Abraham knew his, uh, I think, nephew Lot was there. And, you know, he's bargaining, saying, but will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? How about if there's 50 righteous in the city? Will you destroy it? No. How about 45? No. How about 40? No. How about 30? No. How about 20? No. How about 10? No. Moses probably thought, yeah, I better not. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Abraham. Abraham probably thought, yeah, I better not push it. You know, in a city like that, they couldn't even find 10 righteous souls. So what do the angels do? They grab Lot, his wife, and his two daughters and drag them, drag them, probably kicking and screaming, out of the city. Said, we're going to wipe this place off the face of the earth. And what about L.A.? New York City. Chicago. Miami, Atlanta. What happens when you can't find 10 righteous people in a city? Look out, buddy boy. Ezekiel twenty-two thirty, 30. And I sought for a man among them that they should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them, I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. And that's the end of chapter 22. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.